Hello everyone, I am Corey Andrew Powell and I am very excited today because I am joined by Dr. Adolph Brown who along with Ali Wentworth co-hosts the new ABC unscripted series, The Parent Test. Now, Dr. Brown is a clinical psychologist, master teacher and mental health keynote speaker and the founder, president and CEO of the Business and Education Leadership Authority. Dr. Brown, welcome to Motivational Mondays. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's my pleasure, especially because not even just aligned with the work, just I have a, a passion for helping young people myself because we've all been a young person and, and, and confused, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Right. So it's like we ha we owe it to uh, the new generation to bring some of our, our knowledge uh, forward for them to help them have an easier time. So uh, to begin with, congrats on the show, The Parent well, thank Test. You. Thank You're you. You're very welcome. Yes, of course. And I would love if you would share a little bit uh, about that show and what you'd like audiences to gain from it. Sure, Corey. Corey, it's actually one of the most value-added television programs today. And I would say that if I wasn't a part of it, uh, one of the reasons I am a part of it is because it's a show that's informative, it's entertaining, and there's quite a bit of explosion. So, Corey, what we have, we have 12 families that have allowed us to put their parenting styles under a microscope. And for a parent to do that, for a family to do that, it means that they, they hold that all really closely to their chest. So they're prepared to defend it. So, uh, the, so, so the other parents, they, they take turns pretty much looking at each other's styles. And what we do, Ali and I, we, we actually give them a series of challenges to see if their parenting styles will actually stand up to these challenges. So like I said, it. my hope is that when people watch, they'll be able to develop a toolkit, a parenting toolkit, but also it, it's time for a national conversation around this topic. We don't talk enough about it because it's so personal and we don't want to be scrutinized. And unlike most things in life, uh, you don't know how well of a job you've done as a parent <laughs> for many, many years. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, either your kid will tell you one day over Christmas, after one, <laughs> one glass too many of wine, or yeah, exactly. Or, 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 the, or the letter I have them write from my therapy office. <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah. Well, listen, I have to tell you, know, and we'll get into that later. Uh, therapy is a big deal because you know I, I really identified with something that you um, talk about when you do the two bag conversation. Yes, the, two the, backpacks. The backpack. Yes. Yeah. So the two backpacks, uh, we'll get into that because that the therapy thing is so tied to that. But you know, you mentioned it being so personal. It's funny. It's just this morning I was on Instagram and there was a funny video that I think Viola Davis shared of like, um, a, a, a black grandma trying to get her little granddaughter just to um, admit admit or not if she had just um, went wee wee in her little um, uh, pull up her pull ups and a little girl was going all round and about you know like kind of avoiding the question until uh, grandma jokingly picked up a, a spatula and said I'm gonna ask one more time and did you pee in your thing and she said yes. <laughs> and it was a joke. They laughed at all. Right. And, uh, but in the thread underneath, it became, oh, they're awful parents. I can't believe that she threatened her child. And and it became exactly what you just said. All these parents started arguing over what was really sort of an innocuous video, I think. Yes, yes. Um, but they took it personal. And yeah. It started, it started <laughs> and, yeah. And, 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 you know, and, and parenting is not only personal. There are very many um, cultural aspects. To parenting mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I have different issues parenting my eight children in in the United States of America mm -hmm. than than some of my non uh, African American friends. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think uh, until you really explain that to people who are not African American, uh, they don't know that conversation that Black moms very often have about how their children have to go out into the same world that white kids go out into, especially for me. I was getting that conversation from five years old. Yes, yes. And and, and what happens is we are, we're all, as parents, concerned about our children. We're concerned about their safety, their whereabouts when they're not in our uh, presence. However, uh, there's a, more of a concern for African-American parents that you return home because there's a society that doesn't always value your life. And, and I say a society, and not necessarily a society, but there are individuals in society that don't always value your life. So they're, they're th that conversation of, about 
putting your hands on the steering wheel, both hands when you're stopped by law enforcement, looking in the eye, not making any sudden movements. And, you know, that could be the difference between you coming home or not. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, I recall um, keeping, I, and this is like, you know, I mentioned again, five years old or so, I was already having the conversation before we go into the store. Yes. Uh, my hands got to keep them, you know, like, don't look like I'm putting something in my pocket. Cause I will, I mean, I, people don't realize that this is literally how many young black children are indoctrinated into life in America. Yes. So, you know, I, I love the honesty in those conversations. And on that same note, I also want to connect another dot that I saw you um, in a conversation about race and you said something really interesting. I would love for you to explain it. You said um, the, we, we, we should not always believe what our brain tells us. Definitely. And when it comes to racism. And so, so please share a little bit about that. Definitely. So neuroscience is where I believe the conversation should start. It, and I try to start it where it's something where we all have in common, Corey. And that's, we have a brain. However, most people believe that the brain was designed to help us to think. When in actuality, our brains were designed to help us not to have to think. The brain plays like this go fish game uh, or concentration, you know, it's an old game. So the brain finds a match for things, it stores it so that it can later help us predict the future. So that's not about correctness, that's about efficiency. So my, my favorite statement is don't believe everything you think Bec because the brain gives us information based on matches and not necessarily information based on correctness. So the example I often use, if you saw the news last night and you saw someone who looked like me, if you don't reboot your brain as the supercomputer that it is, then your brain's gonna do exactly what it does on autopilot. It's gonna make you think I'm that person and, and cause you to treat me like that person. And if you saw that person from a side profile, that might cause you to treat me uh, in, in a maladaptive manner. So I tell people, well, if you saw that television show last night, it wasn't me because I didn't do any interviews on television last night. I'm only doing this one with you today. So, so the brain, so that, so our brain is often wrong. Uh, I tell people this, Corey, have you ever been in a car accident? Uh, wonderful. But most people who have will tell you that there were parts of the accident that appear to happen in slow motion. So that's the brain kind of like flipping through its Rolodex, trying to find a match. And the reason is, take, you know, and when it's looking for that match, those are like tiny little movie frames to make it look like it's in slow motion. And the reason the brain's actually flipping through the Rolodex, because that's an accident. It's not something that happens every day. So the brain doesn't have a quick reference for it. Did the accident happen wow. in slow motion? Of course not. It just appeared to. So we can't believe everything we think. Okay, that is fascinating. Like, who, like I, I mean, I've never heard it explained that way. Um, yeah, like, 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 just to your point, like, so the brain is just searching for something. The database has no reference for the car accident because you've never had that before. That's right. So it can't play the match game. Exactly. As it would if you were to say, oh, well, to be really blatant, oh, well, that's what a Klansman looks like. Or, exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. In regards to race. I'm exactly. Saying, right? Exactly. Wow. That is fascinating. Now, I mean, I think that when it comes to that too, then the conversation has to be had about why is that programming happening? So that's when I think the social consciousness comes into play. So what is the correlation between, you know, do we look for a remedy for that? Do we all try to adapt this theory and say, okay, as a society, we need to combat it. And then how do you do that? Well, so what I just explained was actually called implicit bias. It's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just a thing. And what we do with that thing is what matters most. So where we have fallen short in the discussion is that we can't control all 400 billion messages that the brain gives us a second. And if we did that, we wouldn't have time to do anything else. But we can control <laughs> or, or we can protect our mouths and our behaviors from our brain. And when I say, when I say that, I ask people, how many of you would have friends if you said everything that was on your minds? <laughs> you know, uh, how many of you would still be in intimate relationships if you said everything that Just was like on your mind? Just <laughs> Exactly. 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 Yeah. How many <laughs> would still be employed if you said everything that was on your mind? <laughs> so the first rule of thumb is if you think it's going to be offensive, you don't have to say it. 
Secondly, there, the brain also has this thing called confirmation bias. So the brain doesn't like to be wrong. It really does not. So the brain is looking to make sure that wherever I made that match, that it was a good match. Not it was correct, that it was a good match. So we have to challenge our brain. We, we have to. So, you know, Corey, true thinking is actually very rare. So, so what the brain does in these in that the match game, it dichotomizes things. It makes it look extremely linear, black, white, victim, oppressor. When in fact, we live the majority of our lives in the gray, and that's where the true thinking actually occurs. It's funny too because I think in my mind, oh well, I'm completely very um, fair, and you know, I'm not biased about anything. And like as you're saying it, I'm like, no, I, I have work to do too. Like, you know, I'm not exempt from any of this because, you know, I'm programmed the same way to respond to things and just make that quick match and then decide, like, that's how it is. And um, I think especially especially now in a very divisive time that we're in with, yes. you know, it's almost like it's being fueled more. So what I'm getting from you, though, is that it boils down to accountability for us to just take more action or, or more um, – just more responsibility over our words and actions. Definitely. And, and and to the degree that understanding what your word and actions can do. When when we don't protect our mouths from our brains and something is said that's offensive to me as a black man, there's something I ask people, you know, who in the room has a roof? And, you know, sometimes people think I'm being facetious, but I'm not because there are homeless people in my audience. So I'd say, who has a roof? And the people that raise their hands, I'd say, how many of you had to replace your roof or repair it before your 30-year warranty expired and get a bunch of hands? And I said, well, you know what happened? Weathering. And I say weathering is premature aging. And that's what is caused to people when you don't protect your mouth and your uh, behaviors from your biases. Weathering. Now, you could see it on your roof. You can see a missing shingle, but I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about a more invasive weathering where it gets down in the wood and it rots and it's structural damage. That's what happens to black and brown people. Uh, ulcers, hypertension, toxicity, trauma from weathering. Mm. Well, that same conversation is also aligned with the debate people continue to have over the First Amendment and somehow this distortion of the First Amendment, giving them the right to just say anything. And, uh, you know, and I often will, you know, to, to get really academic with them, I'll, you know, I will actually say, listen, I assure you that James Madison did not pen <laughs> the First Amendment for you to go on Twitter and act a fool. Like, that's I love so it. not what he was in. Oh, like, that's, you know, the, that's, the, that's the best analogy I've heard. I mean, <laughs> I love it. And it's the Second Amendment one, too. Like, you know, we're talking about a musket versus an AR, right? That's right. So these are very simple <laughs> things to dissect. But, um, but people love to, you know, feel like the First Amendment somehow means they're free to say everything. And you know what? They really are. But to your point, where is the agency? that you're supposed to have over your own self, not to um, be hurtful and harmful well, to others. That's where the that's where the true change occurs. So the brain, again, an organ that tries to keep us alive, it wake up, we, it, when we wake up, the brain searches the environment for an enemy, a threat. So the true agency occurs, Corey, when I get people not to first look at or for an enemy, but at first look at the inner me. And that's challenging for a lot of people. Most people would prefer that easy way of looking out and judging. Judging, you know, takes, you know, your eyes and your brains. To see someone as opposed to look at someone, it takes your eyes and your brain and your heart. So I constantly tell people, before you buy my book, no, I don't want you to do a book study, you know, as a remedy. I want you to do a heart study first. That's the agency. Amen. And I think that ties into another one of your other platforms, which is teaching more student empathy yes. and how that correlates to anti-bullying. So just keep so bringing it back to just youth in general, like just all youth, no matter what their ethnic backgrounds, the bullying uh, crisis is something that has just really risen in recent years. Um, but you talk about building student empathy. So, so discuss the correlation between how that might remedy bullying. Well, first of all, if you can look in the mirror and love that reflection, the correlation is you're, it's easier for you to love me. 
if you don't love yourself, I mean, you know, I think we have boiled it down to hurt people, hurt people. Well, well, where does that come from? That comes from the fact that if you don't love yourself, it's really likely that you won't love me. So, so it starts with that reflection, that, that initial self-esteem and, you know, we, any, all those self words, self-esteem, self-concept, self-efficacy, all those things that you get from you and not the world. And, and if you skip over that, there's likely to be um, detriment, not only to you, but to your fellow humans. I can speak to that too, because for me, once I became more of a public speaker in this forum and leading conversations, uh, which has been going on for a few years now, I realized that I had to be a lot more responsible in what I was saying and putting out in the world. But it really was tied to how I I want to be perceived well. I want people to perceive me as not being part of the problem, but part of the solution. Yes. And that's like, you know, so I had that sort of self-assessment of what I wanted to contribute to the world, right? And that made me want to go out and to your point, like what I see at the end of the day, <laughs> what was the job that I did? And was that something I'm proud of, right? So yes. it makes all the difference in the world. It does. And, and, and Corey, I think too, we have dwindled the, defini the definition of empathy to putting on someone else's shoes, which is not the case. True empathy starts with you believing what someone is telling you. That's number one. Secondly, it involves self-reflection and introspection. Once you hear what I'm telling you, then you look with inside yourself to find similar emotions, similar feelings. And then and only then can you come close. Doesn't mean you will understand me, but you can come closer to understanding me at that point. So even empathy requires that self-work. And, and people, are just, people have always skipped over it. But now it's even more, you know, it's easier to skip over it now. You can Facebook your problems instead of facing your problems. So th that, that's another issue. Yeah. Well, that's also tied to the, the, the problem that I think youth, uh, they're having today because there's that whole digital, that digital existence that we didn't have to contend with growing up where, oh my gosh, if there was like an Instagram when I was a kid, I don't even know what. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Thank goodness. There, <laughs> thank goodness there, there wasn't, I would have been in trouble, but you know, it's it's a lot to contend with. And you're right, there's an instant gratification. People can hide anonymously behind their computers and say all kinds of yes. things without feeling like they have any fear of repercussion. Exactly. So it's a minefield for, uh, for young people. But I know that you are very passionate about uh, that particular demographic. And you do like, I think it was over uh, 100 different youth facilitator groups over one course of, over the course of one year. But tell me why was it, uh, why was that particular demographic a passion for you to to get in and, and deal with their mental health? Corey, the issue for me was um, I had a very challenging upbringing. And um, my mom and dad divorced after 21 years. Um, we were solidly middle class. When dad left, we went to inner city poverty. One income couldn't afford two households. We got the shorter end of the stick. Uh, my oldest sibling and only brother Oscar became my hero. And he was murdered when I was 11. So I had, I was carrying quite a lot of load, um, that backpack and had educators that actually understood it over time, what was going on with me. I was a student with one foot in gifted education and one foot in alternative education, which at the time was kind of perplexing to educators. Um, so I tell people, I don't believe it was my uh, IQ scores that made that got me into gifted education. My grandparents stepped into my life when my dad left, or stepped in more so, I should say, uh, and they were farmers. And my grandfather only had a third grade farm school education, but to this day, he's the wisest man I ever met. And I tell people, you might be smarter than me, but you'll never outwork me. My, my grandparents were farmers. There was never a quitting time. You finished when the work was done. So that kind of mentality. And then the other side of the alternative education, the gangs, I was gang involved, uh, making really poor decisions. And again, my grandfather, long before I went to a therapist, uh, my grandfather told me, he said, son, I know what the issue is. He said, you don't love life enough to fear death. 
So he, he said he understood why I was putting myself in harm's way. So it was really important at that point that, you know, I started my mom and school put me, I started seeing a psychologist or therapist for that matter. And um, I used to say, this was a big ripoff. Every time I went, this guy never says anything. I'm the one doing all the talking. It's a ripoff. <laughs> and, then, and then I grew up and I said, you know what? It looked pretty easy. Maybe I'll try to become that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just sit there and get yep. my check. <laughs> right. But, but, but again, it, it was really helpful. And the advice that I give young people today, Corey, is really simple and straightforward. It's a three e a three e approach. I say, what helped me is I learned to manage my emotions, my ego, and my energy. And when I talk about my emotions, um, not um, suppress my emotions, but I learned to manage them. So when I was angry, I learned to sit on my hands which had forced me to use my mouth. And I learned that my mouth for, was for kind words and not mean spirited words. When, when it came to managing my ego is understanding that I'm not the biggest, baddest thing in this world, helping me with humility, helping with me with more uh, healthy self-awareness and managing my energy. And I think being that the new year is coming, this is a really important one because people would set out these lofty goals. I'm going to work out more. I'm going to eat better. And what will happen is they'll say, I, you know, uh, uh, there's not enough uh, you know, time in a day when everybody has the same amount of time. It's what we do with our energy that matters. I'm a, I manage my energy and I'm, I'm a classic introvert. Doesn't mean we're shy. Just means we don't get our energy from other people. I love solitude and silence. Uh, but I also love people. But I recharge with solitude and silence. So when I learned how to manage my energy, my ego, my emotions, um, I was told that I could do anything I, that I aspired to do. And that's proven to be true. Anyone who has watched you do any of your talks, and I, of course, we will we'll give links so people can watch your live talks, um, that seems very far removed from the introvert to me. <laughs> <laughs> you be running around the stage like, yeah, so if you say so, but, energy, okay. energy management. So, so what, Court, with a nap, well, and, 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 and the other thing, so energy management is really knowing what you have to do. Mm. So, so, so what can throw me off? So, so I get to meet you today and, and then, you know, I plan on working out and kind of chilling out. What will throw me off if someone says you forgot about another meeting on your schedule? Mm. because I purposely planned my energy to do certain things. Now, it doesn't mean I can't be flexible, right? but energy yeah. management is huge to me. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great, that's, that's a great point. I just last week I interviewed, um, he's a former Disney executive, like a legend at, at the Disney Corporation. Uh, Lee Cockerell is his name. And um, so he's, you know, really just all about sort of this, even to the point where you plan your morning each yes. day, you know, 15 minutes each day. Like what is, what does today look like? He's like, he said, <laughs> we plan our vacations. We plan these big weddings. We plan all these events, but our life is like the biggest event we'll ever really have, have yes. to manage. And we don't, we don't put any planning oh. usually, yes. you know, on and, the day to day. And, and you can plan all day long and, and, with, and put it in little time slots, but just like the fastest car in the world without any gas. It's not going anywhere. Not going anywhere. Yep. So that energy, energy, ener at the end of the day, I wish more people thought about energy management. They, they'd really, mm -hmm. you know, if you wanted to work out after work, then that means you have to pace yourself throughout the day. Mm -hmm. It's not just time. It's energy. Yeah. He actually says time management is actually life management. So you guys are like literally <laughs> bookends, which is great because when I hear successful people, you know, that's one great thing about this show. I find these common denominators with successful people and that's what we give back to our community. And we're like, you know, Hey, these things work. Like, that's right. You know, if the, if the head of Chuck E. Cheese and the head of <laughs> <laughs> Disney, you know, that's right. And now Doc Brown are telling well, you this, appreciate you know, it. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> But, you know, when it comes to young people, though, you have to encourage them, I guess, at a point where they and I say they meaning we, too, when you're young, you don't necessarily uh, think about the future because of the invincibility of youth. Right. And we've all been there. So I know with you, when you have the conversation um, about achieving greatness with young people, and I know you talk to them about creating a legacy. Yes. 
how do you approach that conversation with the kids who really, they don't see past like the last Taylor Swift album? Well, you know the, what I mean? the very first thing you let young people know is that choices have futures. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the very first thing you let them know. And secondly, I will say you want to be very careful to ensure that your older self does not get angry with your younger self for a choice you made that you didn't think through. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One of my favorite quotes from you is a different iteration, I guess, of something that someone else who I loved interviewing, uh, Stedman Graham said to me when I, he was one of my first kind of like, you know, more bigger names in like the education sector. And, um, you know, he had a very similar comment, but your quote is so succinct when you say, our past is a place of reference and not, not resi residence. When I heard that, man, when you said that, like just because, oh, I got goosebumps because I know so many of us are stuck yes. in those choices of the past, never get beyond it. And I always feel like you have cheated your future self yes. of what you're supposed to be if you get stuck on what you who you used to be. You yeah, know what I mean? You cheat your future self, but look what you do to relationships. When we don't address the rejections of our past, they become projections in our present. Mm. So we bleed on people who didn't cut us. Mm. Yeah. Bringing all this baggage, quote unquote. I mean, that's really what that, that is. That, that's you know, that's exactly what it is. Terms, right? That's yeah, exactly what it is. Yep. And it could be uh, in the workplace or um, romantic relationships, friendships. And I know that's I was right. guilty of that a few times where someone did me wrong. So I'm very bringing all that <laughs> mess. That's right. <laughs> That's into new relationships, yeah. So it, then tie that into neuroscience. So anybody that reminds you, if you don't reboot your brain, anyone that reminds you of that person, <laughs> you're likely, in any little thing, you're likely to treat that person in a similar fashion as the brain looks for that conf confirmation bias. I think one of the things that we don't think about enough in our interactions is that everyone is different from us. Because we, we immediately say, we go to the ego. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't have treated, I wouldn't have done that. Why did you? No, every single person, whether it's a student, a coworker, a spouse, intimate relations, every single person is different from us. They're not us. And, and that's, that, that's kind of like the crux of, of, of getting things back or not even back getting things to a point where we're healing together in, a, in society we are here today with dr adolph brown whose new show is the parent test on abc we wish you a lot of success with that show and thanks again for being here today we appreciate it thank you for having me